And might you all take a deep breath with me with a long exhale and a sound of an exhale if you're willing. Mm. <laughs> 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 so, um, a big topic to cover. Only 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Say the title is tongue in cheek, or that tongue between the cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there are as many definitions of uh, amazing sex as there are people listening, which could be wildly divergent and reflect the uh, amazing diversity of human experience. Um, I can't see the mic in the way. Expression experiences. Um, so I might not speak to your experience, um, definitely not to everyone's. And uh, I'm there to be as inclusive as I can and mix it with my own experience with what others have said. And um, when I was at school, I learned something not about sex, but about exams, which was uh, <laughs> to examine the words in a question. I'm going to do a bit of that now. Mm -hmm. um, in this script, what does it mean to have amazing sex? So, some synonym, synonyms of have are to possess, own, retain, enjoy, or keep. I say amazing sex is not something I can possess and would be hard to quantify, uh, but I know I've experienced it. Mm. Mm. In Betty Martin's We Live in the Set model, having amazing sex would be in my domain, which she defines as things I have um, a right to and a responsibility for. And I own it in the sense I experience it in my body, which includes my mind for me. Uh, so the experience would be more descriptive than the term to have. Um, and what about amazing? Again, your mileage may vary. Some folks might be amazed to have any sexual experience at all. Um, others might regularly revel in amazement. Some synonyms of amazing include astonishing, awesome, breathtaking, extraordinary, incredible, marvellous, spectacular, stunning, surprising, remarkable, unexpected, and wonderful. Mm. Uh, and I guess a particular individual's use of the term might shift over the change over time depending on their mood. And lots of other variables. So what about sex? Um, key to amazing sex, in my opinion, is to deconstruct societal scripts, or all the shoulds, and to ask who's defining sex and where is the definition coming from. And the scripts in this society tend to be heterocentric and phallocentric. So people talk about the sex act, by which they mean penis and vagina. Um, can people without penises have sex? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> well, people who need penis and vagina sex is difficult or impossible. Does any genital contact count? Uh, so, thinking about sex more expansively, you could include a touch, a look, a thought, you need to more possibilities for pleasure and more possibilities for amazing sex. Uh, what are some reasons we have sex? This is from the Good Enough Sex Model. We want good enough sex. They've <laughs> <laughs> uh, got the reproduction right at the top there. Uh, so, side of that. Um, the paper's not really as straight as I'm, as I'm kind of painting it. They say that pleasure is as important as function and relaxation is the foundation of pleasure. Uh, and having variable, se flexible sexual experiences and abandoning these for perfect performance. Uh, supportive of couples overcoming support, pressure, fears of failure, and rejection. What are some reasons that you have sex? It's cooler to do. <laughs> <laughs> A picture of so-called normal sex <laughs> from Robert Anthony Wilson's Sex, Drugs and Magic, The Journey Beyond Limits. And I've got a bit of a round ball here, and then uh, a bit of a round ball. <laughs> 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 quite, long, quite a long round. And then um, a peak, and then the resolution phase. Depends on how long that is. Yeah, no multiple orgasms in. And so Robert Anthony Wilson has a, has a 
<laughs> the stage is beyond that that he describes in his book. Mm -hmm. Using two experiences and so called peak experience, which could be aspirational or terrifying. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to present three uh, keys to potential on eating sex. Uh, that might help it to be more likely to occur. One of which is curiosity. Uh, and I think learning, learning for me is a really important and fun part of sexual interaction. Like having a fun ball down there might not be as amazing as having a more nuanced uh, experience. More knowledge can lead to greater granularity and the possibility of more precise differentiation, differentiating between possibly adjacent areas. Uh, and with that you can be really clear about what you want or what you want to offer somebody else and negotiate with greater specificity. Um, so ways to build that are just like look at anatomy. Um, is a sort of KB Dragons <laughs> anatomy thing with uh, some gaps. And here's the like a trailer map. Here's the picture with some more deeper volume of vaginal structures. So if you know that there are clitoral legs, for example, then you can intentionally um, interact with them. But if you don't, then you can't. Now, the same goes for the bulb of the penis and the prostate. If you're <laughs> aware of them, then you will have to find them and play with them. But these pictures are depicted some general versions of genitals, and individual genitals may be very different. So, um, as a sort of ge a general most people fall in, in a particular area, and then there are uh, massive variation between individuals. So you should be aware of that. Um, so that's for like sex characteristics, and then gender is also sort of biomodal. <laughs> this is a picture depicting some variations. The author, Amanda Mon tonight. Montanez says the graphic shows a small cross section of these conditions, uh, she's intersex condition, and the pathways they can follow. In an additional area of complexity, the gender with which a person identifies does not always align with the sex they're assigned to birth. <coughs> they may not be wholly male or female, and the more we learn about gender and sex, the more these attributes appear to exist on the spectrum. Um, that's a bit about anatomy, I think it's good to know about anatomy. Um, Another way to build the ability to interact sexually with greater specificity is to study physiology. Um, which I think is super useful to know about oneself uh, and others, both general and specific individuals. Like the different genital configurations can tend to have different arousal times. Um, which one's this? Um, so in, when, I was, when I was growing up, uh, my mum went through a radical feminist phase and told all these amazing books like Our Bodies Ourselves and um, Nancy Friday's book of female fantasies, women's fantasies, um, but about Erica John's Search for the Zipper's Fuck and Fear of Flying, and um, Rachel Kennedy, like when I was eight and onwards. <laughs> and what I learned from that is that many women and many people are sexually unsatisfied in their relationships. So that had a big uh, impact on my feelings development. And also, that Kim said a lot of people who say that it's great to have same-sex experiences and vice versa. Um, so another thing uh, to explore could be what are our scripts, what's our individual turn-ons in our kinks. Jaya talks about erotic blueprints, and the erotic mind, Jack Morin talks about core erotic themes. So that's what he suggests people track their peak erotic experiences. So look at your individual styles and triggers, like that your arousal occur spontaneously or in response to something. Mm -hmm. um, chat with study on our course, Donald Mosher proposed three arousal styles distinguished by a focus of attention. One is partner engagement, which focuses more mostly on personal interaction. Um, and another one is self entrancement, somatic or trance arousal, which focuses more on the, the individual's body. A source of pleasure, and um, person may look attached or passive, uh, and that's what I'm really into like erotic massage and 
navigating erotic trance states. Another one is role enactment arousal, there's three of them. And focusing on role play, fantasy, variety, and experimentation. So, like BDSM, dressing up, uh, playing with props. They could be useful to uh, look at these different models, useful to know what gets me hot, what work, might work for others, to explore styles uh, I'm less used to. Uh, and flexible scenarios can help to handle periodic normal variation of sexual response to self and others. And pre between different arousal styles can help with adaptation and expanding the palette of available pleasures. Theory? That's a bit of theory. And then um, <laughs> practice as well, practice. <laughs> so if, you always, if you do always do what you always do, you'll probably get what you always got. And so thinking back to amazing, meaning unusual or novel, um, epiphanies usually take us by surprise by doing something unusual or different. So can you guarantee amazing sex? <laughs> Not always, right? Um, but you can make it more likely to occur, I think, by practicing alone with another and or with others. Um, genital mapping is a sexological bodywork practice that builds granularity and differentiation, so you can make more specific requests. Um, and on the CSP course, we talk about concerto space, which is like an orchestra playing, everyone's in time, everyone's in tune, everyone's doing the same thing and comes to a crescendo at the same time, versus practice space, where you might make mistakes, kind of jam, with things, test things out. And sex is often seen as a, as it, like it should be a concept that musicians practice more than they perform. And mm -hmm. um, so erotic experimentation benefits from being erotically creative without moral judgments and repercussions. And it's good to expect and accept that it might seem boring at times if you define sex as something that has to work or flow, not flow. Um, seeing sex as a play and exploration can get away from the pressure of perfection and performance. And it might involve taking turns, like in the three minute game that Sean and I will be playing with at the weekend, uh, and moving away from the model of both people should be off equally at the same time, although that could maybe happen too. Uh, and it might involve playing with things, experiencing things more than once to uh, find the juice to learn new skills, to find new ways of feeling, to build new experiences, or get acclimatised to them. So, for example, most people with penises will have to do a lot of practice to um, to have non ejaculatory pure orgasms. Uh, the practice also builds neuroplasticity. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So, repetitive practice over time fits and builds new physical pathways to pleasure. An uh, example of that is for, for some people playing with their G-spot might not be uh, the, more, the more they play with it, the more they might build those connections for pleasure and for sensation. <coughs> Curiosity. Um, communication. <laughs> so communication, <coughs> as many people have mentioned, uh, Previous speakers have mentioned it's really important to communicate, to be vulnerable, to be open, to be clear about what's happening, and learning how to articulate that. So I take practice again, uh, noticing what I want, being able to articulate it, being able to make requests, uh, and be specific. And the third uh, key, I think, is compassion. So being kind, be I like Carl Rogers' core conditions of counselling, that empathy, congruence and unconditional positive regard. So being kind with myself, being kind with others, be kind with yourself, um, letting go of perfectionism and shoulds. This is a slide from a, a colleague, Klein Katz, about what they think contributes to optimal sexual experiences. Uh, this is from a talk at Breaking Convention, the Psychedelic Conference, where they did, uh, they did a study on mushrooms and depression, uh, but they worked in questions about sex as well. So they were able to ex extract that and do a presentation purely on sex and psychedelics. So, psychedelics, MDMA, will also lead to amazing sex. 
um, and probably enhanced if you have curiosity, communication, and